Welcome back to the Adventure Athletes podcast. This week we've sat down with Joe Dilling, also known as the Stammer PT. Um, Joe's got a very fascinating story. He went from growing up with a stammer to joining the military and then progressing on to be a personal trainer. Now, most people would see having a stammer as a bit of a weakness for a personal trainer, someone that has to come in and talk to people constantly. Um, but we discussed with Joe about how he turned a uh, perceived weakness into a superpower. Um, we also spoke about how exercise helps with his stammer and how his um, experience as a PT has developed and made him a more empathetic person. Now, if you like this episode, make sure you follow us on Spotify, um, share the content with your friends and check us out on Instagram. Every comment, every like, every share really helps us grow the podcast. Um, so make sure you just try and engage with our content as much as we can. Um, we really want to hear from you as well. We want to know what you want to hear about and we want to know who you want to hear from as well. So check us out. Check Joe out. Very interesting person. He's got a really good program, the Coach for Joe program. And enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the Adventure Athletes podcast. Am I ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Right then, so we're going to start off with a question that Perry asked on the last episode with the Mountain Men, and I think it's a solid question, which is when you look from the outside, obviously having a stand can look like a disadvantage in life, mm. but did you see it that way when you started becoming a coach, or was it more like your own hidden superpower, and why? And then of course he said bad boy, because it's very... Bad boy. Yeah. I think... I first I saw it as a um a weakness in in coaching, especially uh, at fours, because we um uh, do a lot of of circuits like like we have sort of like of sixty in for a um a session. Uh, but I noticed if someone is is new at the a gym, it's actually a a strength. Uh, because uh, they're un unconfident, afraid, and nervous, and I can uh, relate to that. Uh, be uh, uh, because I've suffered suffered from sort of like uh, of low um uh, confidence. Uh, so I'd say I now I see it as a a strength as um opposed to a a weakness as a a coach, I think it like um it's what it makes makes a me like a, a unique, which is as good as a coach. Yeah. So your superpower then is empathy, but not just like the <laughs> standard empathy. It's yeah. Like lived in experience. Yeah. Empathy. Yeah, yeah. I would say it is empathy, empathy, because I am a caring person, and that is like, it's probably is what I, uh, I show in coaching. That's something I definitely notice because obviously I've got force quite often in train, and I'm just there doing my own thing on the platform or like playing around the sled or crawling around like some weird list on the floor. Yeah. And then you're running the semi-private training classes or PT session, and I notice your coaching style has very much got that kind of really calm, mm. affectionate, sort of um, really approachable style, which I think for uh, a lot of people when they come in is quite disarming when you're afraid. Yeah. You walk in those doors, you've got all these preconceptions about what's a PT going to be like, especially like ex-army people. Like, oh, I'm going to be grilled. Yeah. And then you come in and you're like so friendly. <laughs> There's a really good quote I heard before online, which um, was when I first started uh, coaching. It was like, but you want to be the sort of coach that you want to coach your grandmother. I, I, like that. I really like yeah. that. So instead of these like hard as nails coaches that come in and kill you and destroy you, it's like, no, you're going to have that level of professionalism and excellence and service that you can look after someone who's like really afraid, mm. really frail, a lot of problems, and you can deliver at the same level of diligence and care and excellence for someone who is like a, you know, like a hard and powerful. Yeah. yeah. I, I think, think it's, it's um, important to have that, that like as a, a coach, everyone should be um comfortable in a a gym even if they even if they are are new to it yeah i think that's a big 
issue in the fitness industry at the moment, especially with new personal trainers coming in. They've seen all this fitness videos online. Like, oh, if you're not like working hard and using like your only two hours of your day outside of work and life, then you're not working hard enough. Push harder. You got to mm. run hard. Like the whole sort of Goggins mindset is yeah. like just every spare minute you're working. And I think a lot of influencers see that and a lot of PTs see that and it's just like... A jump on it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, let's get all our clients working super hard. And it's like, they've got a life. Like, yeah. This isn't their be all end all. It might be for that influencer, for that person. Like for me, I know very much I am like, yeah, fitness. Woo! Yeah. And then it's like, <laughs> outside of that, in my like training and coaching, um, then it's like, you don't need to be like that. Like, mm. I don't want people to be like me. I want people to be them. I don't have, like, family commitments here. I live on my own. I can train whenever I want. Got a home gym. For nice. someone that's got, like, family, kids, like, a nine-to-five job that they're trying to do, they it's don't need different. to be like that, do they? Yeah. Yeah, like, it is, um, it is tougher. Like, if you've, um, got a, a family, a kids and a commitments and that... Uh, you, uh, you, you um, can't just a focus on fitness. You have to have, you have, you have to as have ex exercise as a an add on, and not and not your um whole life, which is is where a lot of people end up of going in wrong. Yeah, I see a lot with um podcasts as well like the health podcasts that are out you've got like joe rogan huberman podcast that's we're definitely up there with them oh yeah <laughs> definitely. and it's like they're pushing this whole oh you need like eight to nine hours of sleep a night you need to be drinking this much you need to be having all of these supplements like even me i've got my whoop on now like, yeah i'm definitely a podcaster <laughs> <laughs> drinking my fuel um and it's just like for most people they can't spend that amount of time focusing on their health and fitness it's like, or money yeah, yeah. or money, money yeah. too I, that, I was yeah. driving over today actually as I listened to a Herman podcast there's an episode on female uh, hormone optimization, mm. and they just start talking about microbiome for a bit and they were like this guy who he had um, like an autoimmune condition and he started smashing a smoothie with like 57 vegetables every single day and I was like oh my lord like he had this total lifestyle transformation became like a different person from it lost a ton of weight mm. he changed the way he viewed lifestyle but I was like, it started getting into that territory where even while I was driving, I'm super into like my nutrition and mm. fitness. I was like, oh, I need to start putting this in my diet. I need to start putting that in. And I just watched my brain ticking by of like building up almost like this like anxious energy of you like, you need to bring this and you need to bring yeah. that. And it was like, Jesus, this is done look like an eating disorder. I was like, step back, chill, crack the window down, breathe. <laughs> it's too much, isn't it? Like everyone's, everyone's um, on pod a cast is preaching everything at the sort of like of highest is level and not focusing on what's actually important at the sort of like um at lowest if you just start an x x um sizing just um follow a a plan train um twice say a week and you're on to a a, a decent and start you don't have to sort of like of do anything over a complicated if you are starting out as you as as you sort of um improve and and progress obviously sort of like make it make it a bit more a complicated yeah so speaking of exercise then <laughs> your stammer mm. you've dealt with it you've got a, a bit of a story which I'm really, really excited for you to be able to tell mm. with more ears to listen to because I think it's a really underrepresented community and the work when I started seeing it online when you did it, I was blown away. I thought it was really <laughs> powerful and that's why I really wanted to have you on and Will did as well. I so was really excited about it. So you've tried loads of different methods with yep. all the conventional routes, but for you, you found exercise was the best thing. Take us through that. Uh, so like as you've... Um... I mentioned I've tried everything I've, I've been on courses I tried to sort of like breathing in techniques and they all all work it's just that I find it's a surface it's level um 
approach uh, uh, because then in real or life i'm not going to sort of like focus on breathing every single time or using a certain a technique and i think um a stammering and confidence are into are into a linked and i've found the like best a way of improving in confidence is through X X um exercise uh, because I learned sort of like lessons about myself overcoming in physical or challenge and just sort of like um like um seeing a constant uh, progress and then I can um ap apply that to my own own stammer and life so it's, it's a lot as you're saying so there's a lot more surface level the the problems addressing so what I picked up a lot there was we mentioned the breathing and this is kind of go back to talking about like human again yeah you notice there's a lot of like breathing protocols for calming yourself down and funny enough this is not taking a deep breath in it's the opposite it's a slow exhale yeah. but like these are only surface level problems so You've got this deep underlying problem, which is stress, say, for example. Yeah. And it's, your lifestyle's out of whack. Your sleep is terrible. Yeah. You've got, like, financial problems. Maybe your relationship is in the dumpster. Loads going on. Who knows mm -hmm. what? And your mental health is just in the drain. And someone just says, oh, just use this breathing protocol. And it's, like, it's good in the moment when you're stressed, you need to calm down, but yeah. it doesn't fix the problem. Is, is that's that it. kind of, you think that's a good, good kind of, um, not, not a metaphor, but that's similar to what you're saying in the stand yes like i um i think if like it's a like you adjust a paper and over a a crack if you aren't addressing in confidence yeah if you have a a stammer uh, 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 because i i think um a confidence is such an important thing in every area area of life especially if you have got a a stammer yeah so you weren't always the confident coach you were today, I gather. Oh, uh, no. No. So, no. when you were growing up, what was that like having to deal with a stammer when you were... I mean, like, what sort of, did it, were you born with it? Did it start at a certain age? Or did it sort of seem like you might have had one and then it progressed further as you got older? Uh, so, I always... Um, I, I struggled in, in talking. I couldn't... I, I couldn't, like, up and out certain um, words but I guess it sort of like um, it pro progressed into a a stammer when I was a six and from there it it, it was at its it, it's worst in um, in secondary in school in year eight and that's when it started to sort of like um, take a a nosedive and then I'd say it like um improved after I I left the army I think because I was out of of that in environment and I could actually he focus on on me and um improving and be my Myself. Yeah. Um, do you know, like, what causes a stammer? Like, I'm coming from, yeah. like, the outside. I've never, like, met anyone with a stammer okay. before. Yeah. I've, like, I have a bit of a stutter sometimes, something I struggled with when I was a bit younger, but nothing to, like, the same extent as you. So I'm just mm. interested into, like, do you know what causes it? What's the, the reasoning behind it at all? I'm not sure what, what actually um, initially causes a a stammer. I'm not sure anyone actually has it has the answer okay. to that. Uh, but I get um get um affected by it if I'm like I'm tired, I'm stressed, I'm nervous, like like, and that's when I notice it is is worse. But I'm not sure what actually 
he causes it. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's quite interesting. There's so much that people just don't understand about the body it's and mad. why it does some yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's just like, oh, we'll just apply speech therapy. And it's just like, just a symptom. Mm. Like, um, if someone could actually find out uh, what is the cause of stammering, that would, that, that would um, be amazing. I, I could imagine that, well, I've got no expertise in that area, but I could imagine that it's probably going to be like a multi-factor thing. Mm. So it's, there's probably a neurological side to it. Yeah. There's probably a psychological side which comes from the neurological. There might be like an immune system, sort of nervous system thing going on as well, yeah. all combined. And then it's, like, it's a very complicated problem. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, like, um, I don't... I think it is a, a simple all solution at all. No. At, at all, yeah. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> so coming from, like, this, like nervous kid with with a stammer that sort of struggled through school mm. what would you say are like the three defining points that have got you to like <laughs> being who you are now like because it's quite an interesting journey going from someone that struggles talking to someone that talks with people every single mm. day for a living so like what's brought you along that journey three main points uh, probably he started in, in boxing at, at 13 and because I um I um I developed a, a lot of of confidence from that. A second point, I'd say, I'd say um in phase a two a two in the army army because I was sort of like of thrust into a um a leadership. A role, and that's not something I've have done um ever before. But I I found out I I could sort of of lead uh, from my own actions. And thirdly, I'd say uh, I started as a a PT uh, at at force because I'm I'm practicing. In talking every single all day, and that is the sort of like most important thing. If you have a a stammer, you have to practice each each day. Okay. Um. So you spoke about boxing. Did you do it like as a bit of like a career? Was it just something you did on the side? Like, did you get to a decent level? Uh, uh, so at uh, at fourteen, I was in the in top eight in the like um in UK at my sort of weight so as not a semi a semi <laughs> decent <Lucky> yeah. flex <laughs> yeah that's 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 a, that's um a little of flex but I feel like I mainly I use that as a as a um a stress a reliever yeah yeah and it's um. It's something I've stopped um, uh, now, but it's, it's, still, it's still something I use in my own uh, training, a little bit of boxing at the end. Yeah. Did that sort of develop you into the, the military going from boxing to military because you've got that sort of contact sport behind mm. you and you've got the physical fitness because it's insane being, being a boxer, yeah, especially yes. top eight in the UK. Yeah. I think it... Um, it did help me to sort of like uh, push me um, into the army, I think, because at our, our boxing in club, and there was a lot of army, army who, who, who was sort of like a boxing in there. And so I was in that like um, environment and I, um, I, thought, I thought I'd be okay in that environment, yeah. What was it like when you first started in the army then? Because obviously when you go in, it's a bit of a blank slate. So yeah. It's a fresh start. What was that like for you starting off in there then? Because it's a very different environment from school in some yeah. ways, but maybe not in other ways. <laughs> uh, tough. Like, um, I was okay on the on fitness, fitness side of it. 
it was all the other outside of that I I struggled all ribs so like um a being in thrust into um the public speaking like um yeah like obviously obviously I I hated it and then we were sort of like of constant constant just having to put ourselves out there and talk to sort of like like um officers and that and that's not something I've ever um have done so I found that like a pretty pretty e tough and also I I I joined uh, at sixteen so I was sort of like I'm still a um a kid a kid like um at heart so I probably hadn't grown up yet yeah either <laughs> yeah what position did you go in for that's why I was a um a medic in the army again Emper Emphatic. Yeah. <laughs> I know you're gonna gonna, yeah. gonna say that I feel that is actually a a, a, a um a value of mine I just enjoy enjoy helping in people I think even people that don't agree with like the politics of the military and everything the one position they always appreciate is the medic yeah because <laughs> yeah. it's like you're just going out there and you're helping people that have fought to like protect their country protect their rights all of that and you're the person that's yeah. like essentially helping save their lives when they're trying to save everyone else's yeah like and and also if you're a um a medic are you uh, you you um uh, treat the other other uh, aside so you have to sort of like like of treat of treat of treat your own side and the enemy enemy aside so I didn't actually know that yeah mm. yeah which is is tough it, yeah yeah the people that you're sort of fighting against yeah it's like oh my mate's just shot you let me just stitch you back yeah. up <laughs> yeah that's quite a different mindset um, mindset shift I think for most people to get their heads around because uh the amount of people I've come, I've come across every single day and have conversations with and they've got this very um, kind of pinholed view of the world when they see, and this is just in like normal social kind of environments like a coffee shop, friendship groups and they're like they, them, the other, the enemy and they despise them, they hate them, they hate yeah. like members of their own family, they hate people they're in school with and they like, they wish death on them, they wish mm. torture and torment um, and it, these people might have been like just something they didn't like in school or someone's a bit mm. rude to them and then there's you there physically saving the life of someone who the quote unquote team that you are rooting for working for has actually shot in an operation mm. or they've been injured for some reason like how does your head and mind space and sort of um, value sort of get around that because I think a lot of people yeah. could benefit from learning how to step out of their step own back a little bit. Yeah. tunnel vision and step in the shoes of other people and kind of understand where others are coming from. I think it's um appreciating everyone is is worthy of of care and treatment and a um a lot of people in a um a war zone are forced into it. Yeah. It's not actually in your own own choice, and it's like that. Like in um, in life, a lot of our people are forced into a um, a, like a um, a job or situation because of ex external or motives, and it's um, it's not there like. A fault if they um if they sort of of see me a, a bit off, I think, I think it's um it's just it's just it's recognizing everyone has got some something else else on, and not 
and not um taking every everything at face a value yeah I think this is something I see at work because I, I've in the, the past and currently I work with kids that have been kicked out of school mm. um, and we'll go through educational stuff. So I did it when I was in the fire service, we'll teach them like the basic firefighting skills. Nice. Now we do it, um, we do a sports and business BTEC with them. Um, so that's what I do, I'll take them through the BTEC. Um, and everyone's like, oh, I hate working with these kids. They're like a nightmare. They're running around, they're vaping nonstop. They're talking about drugs and all this stuff. And some of these kids are like between like 11 and like 15. Yeah. And it's like, they're just a kid. <laughs> like what's happened to them yeah. to make them be like that? Like they yeah. can't just be like, choose oh, that. it's just this naughty kid. They're not listening to people. It's like something's happened to them. And it might exactly. not be like their parents, it might be something externally, it might be something at school. You'd never know what's going on in these people's lives. And it's mm. just, yeah, yeah. You'd, like you said, you can't take it on face value. Because um, it's never as as simple as it, it seems. Yeah. yeah. I think when you have that capacity, well, at least I find this for myself, when you have that capacity to kind of step back out your tunnel vision, try to put yourself in other shoes, the world suddenly stops looking at this horrible, scary, hostile, everyone's out to get you place. Now, yeah. there's, there is exemptions to the rule. There are some disgusting yeah, people awesome. out yeah. in that world. And everyone has free will as well. And, you know, there's a lot to be said for people who do certain things. But mm. I think when you can understand why someone behaves the way they do, and you're like, oh, shit. Someone's saying that out of fear. Someone's saying that out of insecurity. Mm. You know, someone's like, maybe someone might be mean to you in school. And maybe you can step back now as an adult who's had a hell of a journey <laughs> and done a lot more than most people will. And you can step back and go, oh, they didn't actually hate me. They were really insecure about themselves and they yeah. just used me as a target because I had something that made me different. Yeah. Like, um, that's a, that's exactly it. You literally have hit the email on the... I had there, yeah. I, I certainly say I can feel the same way about that because I grew up morbidly obese, obviously. Mm. So I didn't drop the weight until I was like 17. So all through secondary school, it was like you, well, no, sorry, I was the prime target for like, yeah. oh, let's pick an empty fat. And that was it. And again, like, you know, like not everyone knowing where people come from. So for me, I was dealing with a lot of mental health problems. And yeah. It was a lot of my family culture was ingrained, so a lot of my family came from the valleys, a lot of coal miners, a lot of really hard, like, 12-hour day shift working mm. kind of dudes in the family, so it was, like, a 5,000-calorie diet a day, yeah. and then it was the expectation that, like, oh, the, the boys are going to be men, they're going to go out and work, so we need to feed them up so big and strong, so that was ingrained, and then it was the way that, obviously, we go in the 21st century, life becomes chaotic, everything's more stressful. The way I dealt with that was binge eating because that's what was given to me as a coping mechanism. Yeah. But you, you can't recognise that when you're like 12, you know? No, I'm not seeing Freud. Yeah. I'm not like, oh, okay, well, I'm binge eating because <laughs> you I'm sad about this. At 12, who's yeah. like thinking, th thinking that at 12? At 12, you sort of like, I think everything's, everything's um, important. Everyone is is looking at, at you and yeah. that is not the a case at all. But like, uh, to you at... Uh, at 12 like it is it is definitely i think that's a really good point and i think that's something some people never grow out of is thinking that everything's like personal to them so when someone's being nice to them they're like oh it's because i'm a good person and then when someone's horrible it's like oh that person's been like really horrible to me and it's like you need to like you're saying step back and think mm. like it's not all about me like they might be having a bad day and they've lost yeah. out and I'm now taking that as a personal attack. And when you go through life like that, everything becomes a lot harder when it's like, yeah. yeah, oh, that person cut me up. They're a horrible person. That was an attack on me. And it's like, no, they're just trying to get to work. They're really like, yeah. yeah. They probably even, like, oh, I don't mean to do it. Yeah. And I think that's especially important, like, to try and teach that to kids. Mm. Because I know when I was growing up, like, you both have been, like, bullied quite badly I don't think I was really bullied looking back on it but when I was a kid I thought <laughs> I was trying is great 
<laughs> really good. Good for the character. Good well, for the character. Yeah. I thought I was being bullied, and I I remember like this switching when I was in year eleven. I was going through school, and I thought like all the popular kids were like being mean to me, and like they were like make jokes about me and like make fun. But then when I got in year 11, I was sitting next to one of them and I'd become quite friendly with him because we sat in the same class next to each other. Mm. And then he was like, how come he never like used to come out with us? And I was like, oh, I didn't think you guys liked me. He was like, no, we thought you was like one of the boys. <laughs> and they were just like trying to have a bit of a laugh. And I was like, oh, I've been going through school mm. for the past six years thinking you lot were bullying me. <laughs> and really, good. it was just a bit of banter. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And it was because I was that internalised. I was like, oh, like this is all about me, it's really personal, there's something wrong with me, and the thing that was wrong with me is I was taking it personally. Mm. So that's like the way you see it shapes the world then. Yeah. Very interesting. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, like, picking up on another point you said about going back to the free will, about people have got a choice, like, I had a choice to have that victim mentality. Yeah. But then, like, you were saying about, like, there's some people where it's, like inexcusable what they do and they've got the choice to do that yeah it's then also like not using it as like an excuse what you've been through like I can say for both of you like you've been through a lot and you haven't used it as an excuse to sort of be like horrible back and cynical mm. about the world you're both very positive you were yeah. a medic in the army yeah you're now like a trait while well, you're both trainers out there trying to help people and I think that's like a big thing to realise as well is I've had this experience even if you've then grown up to do things that you're not proud of being able to then switch that mindset and be like mm. I am in control how can I use this to benefit others yeah I yeah. think if I wasn't a coach no sorry if I didn't grow up with beast I wouldn't be a coach today um, yeah, I'm, yeah like I'm saying if I like um, if I if I um. I didn't have a, a stammer. I don't think I would have been a, a coach either. I have probably been artist. <laughs> I loved art, but it's nothing to do now. Physical art is what you're doing now. I am. <laughs> nice, nice, yeah. Oh, so what would you say is like the biggest challenges you face as a PT now? Um. I still, I say it sort of like um, a public speaking, speaking, especially if I'm if if I'm like in a um a, a class of of sixty and I'm like I'm taking a um a warm up or shouting or shouting in change, I find that is like such a nervous ec um experience even even though I have done it like a countless as times yeah yeah so every time you step up there take a BST blood sweat tires if you don't know how yeah that's that's the one get you is it yeah yeah but, but like um I feel anyone anyone would sort of like I feel that um emotion like um even if you I don't have a a stammer I'm not sure, sort of like, of many, many people could um talk in front of sixty people at all, really. So yeah, it's quite interesting the skills you develop as a coach. Yeah, I remember the first time I took a really big class, and it was like, oh, this is weird. And then we moved into the new gym because we used to be outdoors mm. at Broward, and then we moved into a new gym indoors in end of January when sales start fair. And the first session was like round the first day we were in there. But we'd also bought microphones in as well. Wasn't used to it. And it was like this with the headphones on. I could hear myself speak. And I was like, this is really weird. And it actually kind of knocked my confidence back a bit. As soon as I took the mic off and started like, shouting, I was like, I love this. Yeah. Yeah. Like I um, I try and not, not um, I use a, a mic because I'm just not a fan of, of hearing it, it back, which I... I should be okay with it. It's something. It's something I. I still have to. Uh, like um. I work on. 
Yeah. yeah. I think when you hear your own voice, there's a lot of thinking that goes on instead of just speaking. Mm. That you, you're almost trying to like reflect on like, the micro kind of seconds how you yeah. speak. Like, what did yeah. I just say? I'm literally like, doing it now with the headphones on. So you're good in the podcast because you, you don't waste time. Mm. And that must be something for you in particular that you don't do as well. Is because obviously with the stamp, it can take a bit longer to get things out. Mm. You have to, do you find that you have to be a lot more precise of what you say and you have to be a bit more intentional instead of just yeah. waffling? Like I um I, I I try I make everything, eb eb everything I I say important. I'm not put any um. E waffling, because um if I, I do, I guess that. Is more a a, a a chance I, I stammer. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the quality a lot of people could learn. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> Try not to waffle and actually think about what you're saying. Mm. And I think that goes hand in hand with the empathy as well, because if you've got empathy, you're already thinking about the other person, and then if you're then thinking about what you're going to say, mm. I think it just enhances it massively. Uh, yeah, like, um, it's only to a certain extent... I feel though, if you um are thinking in too much, it is a counter abductive. Yeah, mm. good point. So you said earlier about so we talked about the surface level versus the deeper level with dealing with the sound, mm-hmm. and you said if you with exercise, it was the confidence, and yeah. that goes hand in hand with improving the way you speak and the way you see yourself. Hundred percent. What for you builds com- like apart from exercise? What for you sort of defines your own confidence, and how do you think is the best way to go about it? Particularly if you're in your position with a stammer. Uh, so I've actually I've got a um a framework. Yeah. I feel, I I just like um I thought of it a couple of of weeks um ago. The con evidence equals. Uh, taking action and seeing evidence is as simple as uh, as that. Uh, uh, but is it's not easy. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like making a promise to yourself and then fulfilling. Yeah. It. Like I'm going to do this and then doing it. Yeah. A lot of people say they're going to do things that they do. So, what would be your advice for that? Uh, so, um, I think a um important and part of improving in confidence is um a personal old development i feel i feel uh, you have to work on on yourself in in private uh, before you can um ex- express it in public uh, so I do like a um a, a lot of of journaling, a lot of reflection, a lot of of reading, and I I find all that like um it helps, and then I I use what I um I learn and and apply that. Yeah. So do you think habits are a really powerful one for people then? Yes. Yeah. I I feel like it, it, if you haven't got a, a couple of of habits that you you um I do every single day, you are missing out. Yeah. Because they um a play is such a powerful effect. Those are the little wins that build that confidence. The wins each day. Yeah. Yeah. So for you, it's like reading, journaling. Yeah. Um, do you do anything else? Is there like a like any specific exercise ones or any like meditation? Uh, so I um, I see dip. Yeah, I'll see. Yeah, yeah. yeah I do see in the story. I see down there. I'm like, oh, I wish I was in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, like I've um, I've actually I've got a a bit of an idea on that. I want to um, a, a create a. Like like um a dip in a club yeah and just sort of like um it's just a 
it plays first as well. Like, um, have a, a dip, have a, a coffee, and chat. I'll be like, I thought that would be. I'm in, really I'm in coffee C, you got me in chat. So I thought you would be. Yeah. yeah. Anyone yeah. listening that wants to pop along, just <laughs> yeah. drop Joe a message and the club will get started. Yeah. Let's yeah. get this going, guys. Yeah. I, I feel like it's just, just a, um, a good idea. Idea, idea in it. Do you think with the wins as well, like the habits, it's, as I said before, a lot of people make a lot of promises that I'm going to do this and they don't do it. And it's not necessarily because they're lazy, but maybe the goal is too ambitious or they don't realise the steps to get there on the way yeah. do you think dialing it back and breaking it down to smaller steps but also having small steps that are separate to the actual longer goal are quite helpful as well so for you mm. if it's something like I'm going to journal every day and then you do that one day you know, cool I did that you get up do the next day cool I did that three four and then a week you know wow I've journaled every day mm. for a week and you're like yeah I feel pretty good about myself I managed to uphold that and obviously, June itself builds that confidence as well because yeah. of the nature of what it is. And you're like, right, I'm going to see dip every single day as well. Bit tougher. I'm not that, 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 that much. Um, but okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but there's a little sort of weekly habits yeah. you get yeah. as well. But then, say so it's something like, right, I'm going to, I don't know, take like a multivitamin every morning. Mm. Or I'm going to, at first time I wake up, I'm going to drink 500 milliliters of water. And I'm going to put some Himalayan salt in it or something. You make these little promises to yourself that are like really easy to do. And you put them in front of you, like obviously with atomic habits and guess and you've read that. Of course so, I have. You know, like off the four laws, you're gonna make it easy, you're gonna make mm-hmm. it simple. So it's like glass on the side, salt next to the morning, next to the tap, come down. It's so low resistance. You come in, bump, chug, done, and you're like, that's a little win. Stuff like that do you think is really powerful the building up that confidence, kinda of gets yeah. a snowball spinning. Yeah, but I'll be, I'll be because it's it is just um a constant and progress each day and progress it it builds a confidence yeah I think something I've been noticing um, is I do this a lot and it's something I heard online is people overestimate what they can do in a year but mm. underestimate what they can do in 10 years yeah and I think that's something that scales to any amount of time like I overestimate what I can do in a day I wake up and I'll be like right write all my ideas down cool I'm going to clean the house I'm going to make my bed I'm going to cook loads of good food for the week I'm going to train twice I'm going to go to work <laughs> and I'm like yeah I've got all this energy and then I'm like what am I going to do this week and I'm like oh I'm going to do some training <laughs> and then like when I get to the end of the day I'm like oh I've failed I didn't tick everything off I got like 70% of it off but that other 30% and then I'm like I could just do that tomorrow yeah I could spread it all out throughout the week and then it's not as I love that. my superpower at the moment it has been for the last sort of like year now is the yeah. to-do list yeah. I used to love a to-do list and I'd only do one every now and then it's like if I'd send a tie do a couple of tasks and then I'll grab my phone in a sec. I came across, so I came, there's a YouTuber called Matt Devala. He did the documentary Making Minimalism on Netflix. Oh, yeah. Really, yeah. really cool guy. And there's this to do list app called To Do, no surprising, but it's spelled T E U X D E U X. And I came across this through him, and this became my little saving grace. So, nice. I'm going to show the webcam, see if I can see the screen there. Yeah. By the way, they are actually an affiliate for me as well, so I'm straight just plugging them. <laughs> but, yeah. They're going, not an official sponsor of the They're podcast. not an official sponsor of the podcast. <laughs> this is, Let's make that clear. But, this um, is definitely just Taylor going on one of his tangents. I'm going on a tangent here. But for me, what I love about stuff like this is I can set up a to-do for every single day on there. And it's just my habits on there, like, um, like training, reading, strength, uh, strength training, cardio, and then I've got on there like breathwork, meditate, journal, or write. So I do one mm. of those. But you can set things up to do that like, every day or yeah. like, every week, every month, every year. So like birthdays on there and shit as well, which is, you know, but that's not really habits. But you can take things off as you go and you get these little wins in constantly. And if it doesn't happen, if it moves over the next day, so it's constantly there for you and you've got these little reminders. And it's just opening up and having this organized list of things you've got to do in the day. Mm. And for me, that removes that resistance if it's there. Because a lot of the time with habits, I think a lot of people, especially with smaller ones, it's not so much that they're lazy, it's they forget, especially if they've got yeah. a lot on in the day as well, like, ah, I need to, I don't know, I need to meditate for five minutes, and you've got such a long, stressful day, and you forget, and that's where I find that a lot of, 
like the <laughs> more like tech side coming into things now is quite useful when you've got things like Headspace can send you like a bump is a notification you need to meditate for five minutes automates it yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh the power of automation I love it especially when you make things bite sized as well you know <laughs> automation plus bite size plus just like a little bit of consistency and love it's it. like boom you're on the path that is Ellis one of Taylor's tangents when he's like all enthusiastic <laughs> <laughs> Hand, hands up yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> really yeah. But but see I think I'm the opposite to you in that I hate all the phone notifications I, I, I hate notifications it. but I can't stand having to go on my phone to see what I'm doing I'm like old fashioned I'm like pen and paper yeah. and the satisfaction of crossing it off and all of that it's just way more satisfying than I feel that. pressing a button on my phone like, oh, yeah, I, I do love a good pen and paper list but I found for me um, having that on my phone the thing is for start with notifications I have everything turned off on my phone the only thing that comes through is like WhatsApp that's it because that's what I use for like, all my personal stuff mm. and with work as well that's it Even, like email switched off I don't let anything go through in the day and then, even then it's always on silent as well so I'm really hard to get hold of mm. but uh like, I love pen and paper, doing things analog. Like, I'm still, we're in an age where there's so much technology we're training yeah. now. There's so many apps we're using, like, in Brow, we've trainerized for everything. Obviously, up, and this is what I love about Force when I come up there, is still on the SPT class, I see the old pen and paper folder coming out, and that is still how it's I nice, do mate. everything today. Print everything it works. Out. It works for, like, um, uh, for what um, uh, we do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I for me is my favorite way to still train is pen and paper. As I said, with like the phone, the only thing time I actually want my phone on me when I'm training is I'm just checking things that like using like one RPM conversion mm. charts just to quickly gauge where should I be with weights so or maybe I need to drop things down a bit or oh, I made some progress there. But mm. apart from that, I don't really want my phone on me when I train. So I find pen and paper removes that distraction, so I have a lot more exactly. that, that me time as well. Yeah, don't yeah. get me wrong, I do like apps and technology yeah i'm massive spreadsheet nerd <laughs> and you love ai you love ai you I do i don't love ai you must do i really don't <laughs> you keep bringing ai into stuff a lot it was a trending topic yeah i'm trying to keep up with the times yeah <laughs> i don't want to be left behind but at the same time i like how it was <laughs> so you know but yeah spreadsheets massive spreadsheet nerd like Same. my gymnast will tell you this I'll come into training I'm the only coach that will come into training with a laptop and be like right so these are our statistics and this is what the next year plan is and nice. you can see how this is going to ovulate throughout the year And I was sat down doing a shopping list on the spreadsheet this morning <laughs> it was great <laughs> that's, that's, that's a little bit it wasn't it, it it for me, it was someone else, but oh, I was just right. sat there doing this like massive like list and it was like all these different areas and it was like uh, it was great. I, I love like breaking big things down the time. Mm. But I think for me, like I've come to realise that is exactly what got me to where I was with weight loss. It wasn't just like, right, I'm gonna lose a hundred pounds. That that wasn't the goal. It was like, right, well I'm gonna exercise every single day, I'm gonna cut this thing out of my diet, I'm gonna put this thing in instead mm. in the tank. And it was just focused on every single day doing that yeah. and everything else followed. It wasn't like I set make myself this ambitious goal of I'm going to do this or I'm going to do this for this date. It was like I'm just going to focus every single day on living like the person yeah. that I want to be. And that was it. Perfect. <laughs> so on that note, um, do you want to tell us about the CWJ program? that you've, Pardon? Sorry? You've, your CWJ oh, yeah. program? When you've recently started, I've been seeing it all over Instagram. Oh, good. That's so, a, um, a good a sign. Uh, uh, yeah, um, uh, so I've, um, I've started up online online um, uh, coaching. Coaching, again, I did it um, it last year and then had a, um, a, a bit of a, a break. I'm, I'm now, I'm, um, I'm back in and I'm... I'm coaching, coaching in people to achieve um, a con of attendance uh, through X um, a size, enjoy X a size for the first time in their life, and build the e life they I want. Yeah, and that's it in a um 
a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> What's sort of included in the program? Is it just sort of like the training side? Do you deal with like nutrition mindset? What's what sort of the approach? Uh, so I'm um, I'm mainly I'm focused on on training and our mindset. I have my own edge of occasional or content on top of of that. So I am um, I teach the e theory and then move on to the actual or practical okay so it's not just like um giving a man a fish it's teaching a man yeah a teaching fish. a fish yeah like that. it's um it's not um just a, a training program uh because i believe i believe in in coaching and that is a surface it's level one approach and you have to sort of like look at at all your other aspects aspects on top of it. And so like like um a lifestyle a mindset and mental all health is such an such an important important aspect. Yeah. I think that's something like that's throughout the industry. Um whether that's fitness, whether that's, I uh, was talking about it with Kerry for sports therapy, things mm. like that, is a lot of people are scared they're going to lose clients by teaching them everything. Yeah. And really it's like, if I can teach you this stuff and take you through this journey to the point where you can then go off and do it, that's the job. The yeah. job isn't like you relying on me for like 10 years of coming in twice a week and being yeah. like, this is how you do a squat. Okay, you're still just doing squats. It's like, no, we want to teach you to make your own systems and go off. And exactly. that's like a better business model in our, my idea because yeah. then you're constantly getting new people and it keeps it fresh for you. Mm. And then they're happy because they've like changed their life essentially and then they're singing your praises. But then no matter what, like... I still go and get coached. I've been mm. doing fitness for like 15 years now. Yeah. And it's like, I'm whenever I want to learn something new, I will go to a coach like Tom yeah. Jolly, who we had on the podcast. He was my weightlifting yeah. coach. I agree. Um, I've had Taylor help me with my programming. Mm. I'm always getting other people to help me. And I think that's going to be the same no matter how good you get. Like Exactly. Like a, I'm Michael saying. Jordan, he's still got a basketball coach. He's the greatest basketball player ever. When I want to learn something, I just kind of force a train. I just sit around, I watch Simon lift on the platform, and I'm like, okay, I feel very humbled about my own weightlifting. <laughs> Watching, like, push press, I mean, like, 100 kilos overhead, and I'm like, oh, damn, boy. <laughs> Jesus, that man is strong. Um, so, off the back of that, then, uh, I, I, I really agree with that. I think that a good coach coaches, but a great coach empowers people. It's like, as you said, teaching a man to fish. Mm. And it's, it's that fear of losing clients, I think, does it for people. But I think a lot of people don't have that uh, perspective as well, that a coach is also a teacher. Mm. Do you yeah. think it takes a certain individual to have that mindset, or do you think potentially it's just a bit of a industry problem? I feel you have to have your own own story and a journey, uh, because you can only take... Um, as someone as far of as you've took your self yeah and I personally I feel a lot of of PTs are actually putting in the e work them selves yeah and that is why they um are struggling yeah I agree with that I find like I, I'm obsessed with like not just coaching but sports science and I've always yeah. loved philosophy like when I started losing weight I went on this big journey of reading loads of philosophy books and it really changed where I was and I find now that like, I'm constantly grilling my brain with new information and it's not for me it's for other people mm. like, as I said I was driving here today and I was listening to um, the Hubman podcast and there's an episode on female 
hormone optimization. I listened to the male one a while ago and they, they promised on there they were going to do a female one and I really wanted that to be up soon because the mo- the majority of people that I coach are normally um, female clients and I deal with a lot of women that are about age 35 up to 60 okay. so yeah. I deal with a lot of women go for like um, menopause, pregnancy, postnatal quite a lot so I as a coach want to better understand how to deal with uh, anything that comes up yeah. And I mean, go for air, everything in a week. And it's stuff that I just was not taught on my course at all. It was like, it glanced over and it was so important as well. And I was kind of like, why the hell isn't this being educated for? Because it's just like, yeah, you can... Like when I did my level two, it was like they teach you some of the basic stuff like periodization and then they brush it again in level three and they go to it again on level four to like a certain extent. But it's that like you actually have to go and specialise in an area to learn about something yeah, like postnatal. But it's something that you're going to come up across in pretty much every single gym you go to. And that's just something really niche, like you're like a men's only powerlifting gym where mm. everyone's just like snorting chalk or something. <laughs> snorting but, chalk. <laughs> yeah. But it's like... Don't recommend that for if, anyone listening. If, if you were, No, please don't. <laughs> do not do this at home. Don't do anything at home that me and Will do. <laughs> but... If you work in just like a, a bog standard public gym, like a leisure centre, uh, a pure gym, a, a, a gym shark gym, or whatever kind of gym, either like strength condition gym, force, proud, you know, gymnastics, well, but you're obviously dealing with like younger clients more, but it's like you're gonna, there's so many things that come up. Everyone's so individual, we've got such different experiences, yeah. and our bodies are totally different. We've got so many things to shape who we are. And we go in with this like really cookie cutter mindset in the fitness industry. A single, single, all focus on training, on reps and sets. Very mathematical, and we don't seem to and, and to actually deal with these things that everyone comes in with. It becomes specialised, like dealing with diabetic patients. You, you can go specialised at level four in diabetes, level four in obesity, and everything. And it's like all of those things that you could you could go specialise in with, I've pretty much got all of them abroad. I've got people with heart conditions mm. and people who have had like massive car accidents and have lost functions of limbs. We've got people mm. like, you know, their their wrist doesn't work, they can't close one of their hand. There's there's like everything going on there. And you just you just don't get trained for yeah. it. And it's kinda of like if you really want to go and learn how to do that, you need to put in a lot of extra effort outside of what you get taught. You can't just learn the basics because even the basics you learn today in the fitness industry I'd say seem pretty so par to me yeah like un- unfortunately like the um a PT of course is it it's not that um a great at all is it no I feel like I've I've learned a lot outside from it and from my own own learning and and coaching and you know, I um I learn on my level two and I'm free. And you just did your level four as well, haven't you? I've started it. Oh, I've started it. Tidy. Yeah. You're an S, the S and C one, yeah. S and C one, yeah. yeah. So I think there was something I noticed on my level two and level three course. We did it as like a a lot of people doing it instead of going to college. Whereas yeah. I just finished college, so then I signed up to it as like an add-on, um, and. The course, like I remember, I was going to go in for my first exam and I actually got hit by a car going into my first exam, so I missed it. Tidy. (laughs) (laughs) But like I went in the next week and I was having to do the exam on my own. It kind of was bad if you were next week. I tore all the ligaments in my hip. Oh, Oh, damn. (laughs) Yeah, so it was pretty bad, but... You know, get up and go, innit? You can't just see a hippo car not tell us a story yeah, now. You can't just leave us <laughs> a little tangent after this car accident. Cause that, that is... I mean, it's really not that interesting. I was cycling, I was going round around the bend, and I went into the third exit. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, fuck, I've got to go back in. Yeah. Like, I don't know what to do. Yeah. And then I just went straight into the And a car just didn't see me and went straight across the roundabout while I'm going round it at like 60 miles an hour and yeah. just completely wiped me out. Wow. Jesus. Yeah. Ooh, lucky to get away with just a tear then. Yeah. Yeah. Like nothing broke. No, um, I just got up afterwards. I had, like, all the skin on my hand was just ripped off. Um, and I remember, like, I got back up because I was like, I'm late for my exam. I was trying to, like, push my bike along and everyone's like, no, 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 sit down, sit down. I was like, I'm late. I've got to get to my exam. It, if that isn't the epitome of you, I don't know what it is. Get hit by a car, i got to get my exam. Yeah, that is you, that is, And A prize. Yeah, then, obviously, I didn't go in, um... We had 
uh, medic come because I live near the airport, Heathrow Airport, so they came and like from the airport, so it was really quick. Yeah. And then police came and everything, and I was like worried about because the adrenaline wore off by then. So then I was like, I can't really stand up. Um, and then they were like asking me all these questions and they were going to take me home and when they dropped me home they were like oh so like what was the damage to the bike and stuff and I was like more concerned about myself I was like the bike's fine just I just want to go to the hospital (laughs) my mum drove me to the hospital but then like my bike was absolutely wrecked it was a brand new bike Um, and the seat was like literally the bit where it like goes wide and in that bit was just bent at 90 degrees (laughs) from where like it, my I fell on it and my hip had like bent it. Ah. Um, but yeah, that that was the story of that. Jesus. <laughs> so so then we your exam then you said. So yeah, so I was going going to the exam. So I went in the next week and I was asking all the people. There was like nine people in my class and I was like, oh, what was the exam like? And they're like, oh, only one of us passed. Like the rest of us are having to retake it. And I was like, what? Like I haven't revised for this. This sounds really hard. And I went in and I got like a 98%. Mm. And I was like, oh, so it wasn't that hard. And those same people that failed it the first time, one of them had to retake the test nine times. Wow. And they were doing it week after week. So they would go in every week and retake the test. And I was like, So the the, the test was just their revision then? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) pretty much. And there was only three versions of the exams. They would do one one exam, then the next one, then the next Mm. one. They did that three times before they passed. And I was just like, how are they even allowed to pass? I think that, yeah, that highlights probably the biggest issue I've seen with the education for the fitness industry is that it's just ticking boxes. The tutors only get money if they, like, they only get paid if the person passes. Yeah. So they just do whatever they can until they pass. And it's it's all pretty much, pretty much most of it is like, just go sign up online, do it in your spare time. Mm. like there's not many coaches that I bump into regularly that were like oh yeah I went and did my level 3 in person we spent a couple of weeks or days doing this workshop and it's, it's a very practical hands on profession obviously with a lot of theory behind it but it's very theory focused and the theory itself is very rigid yeah. and it's not super applicable I find a lot of what I've learned on my course I don't use a lot of what I've learned outside of my course I use yeah and there's barely anything that I've actually learned on any of my courses that I've found that helpful that I didn't already know prior. And the stuff that I find that I'm actually learning on there and having to, the, the more biological side of it, when I talk about maybe some like blood through for the heart, like on my level three, it's not something that I think about in my day to day. And yeah. it's in such a complicated model that I can even break it down and make it simple if I wanted to understand it and explain to a client in a way that's, you know, the saying that if you really and the sense of it masterfully you could explain it to a child it's yeah. like I could never do that with the way they I, they taught stuff on that but everything else online for free or books I've read or people and conversations I've yeah. had on podcasts could, could do that and the topics are way more complicated like neurology I knew fuck all about neurology until I started listening to podcasts on it and then I can have really full blown conversations about it with people now and it seems really simple and I can understand I get the concepts and theories and models but it's like certain things I learned on my level three, I still couldn't go do because it just didn't stick the way it was taught. Yeah. Mm. I think that's a massive teaching problem and I think it's a massive problem in the fitness industry, which is why there's so many bad personal trainers out there. Mm. Um, there's a plethora. I think something that plays into it as well, um, going back to our points on like how we're coaching people and teaching people to fish rather than giving them a fish it's it all comes back down to confidence in my opinion Mm. like everything seems to be in this podcast everything comes back to confidence (laughs) and the people that i see coaching and this goes for fitness or it'll go for sports like my experience in coaching gymnastics there are people that want to just tell you what to do yeah because Rather it builds than, yeah. their confidence because they're like I'm the person in charge I'm the person with the knowledge it's you like have a power. to listen to me yeah it's almost like a power play because they don't have that confidence in themselves and that's what makes them feel good about themselves yeah whereas like from listening to you two you're all about building that confidence in other people so then they can go out and do it and for me mm-hmm. it's the same with coaching gymnastics yeah with all of my gymnasts shout out to my gymnasts they keep bugging me because they want to be shouted out on the podcast woo <laughs> So um, episode one, I was shouting everyone out, I was shouting out Force, Jack, everything, yeah. you're Taylor, stop just shouting people out. <laughs> but like, with them, 
they will like if you talk to them and they ask you what the coaches are teaching them with a lot of the other coaches they'll be like they're teaching us gymnastics and with me they'll be like they're teaching like Will's teaching me life lessons because I'll sit down with them and I'll talk to them about life and I'll Mm. sit down and I'll literally be like look I don't care about your gymnastics I don't care how good you get what I care about is what you do here and how that affects you when you grow up how's that going to build you in life because everyone knows gymnasts usually quit in their like 20s yeah for professional gymnasts they'll Mm. be done in their 20s and it's like they got a whole life yet. Yeah, They're yeah. only just getting into What's work. afterwards? Yeah. yeah. So, like, yeah, I think it all comes back down to confidence. And I'll see coaches that are, like, they'll go in and that they won't have a plan for their gymnast. They won't look long-term. And they'll just go in and be like, right, we're doing this. And the gymnasts are like, why? They're like, because I've told you to get on with it. And you see personal trainers like that. They're like, yeah. oh, today we're doing squats. And the, the like client might be like, we did deadlifts yesterday. Like, my legs are a bit sore. It's like, no, we're doing squats. It's on the program. Come on. Yeah. And it's like... No, I, I definitely get that. For me, it's like, if I can go off and learn something and then come into work with that and I can identify something in someone, help address it, educate them in what it is, see that change in them and that confidence, that gives me then my confidence, my own ability to like learn and apply what I learn, but also to yeah. help others and kind of assisting people by arming them with the tools and the knowledge to go on that journey themselves is what makes me happy in life. That really fulfills me when I can not go and help others in terms of coming in and doing the work because that's not what I'm here to do, but I can go in and go like, I've got your back, I'm on your team on this one, here's what I know, use me, use my knowledge, use my brain, use my support, smash it when I see that in people as a result that sparks me up that, to quote Mary Condor that sparks joy and that really yeah. gets me buzzing yeah. and I think that's something that coaches have to realise as well but then also coming from the other side is not everyone's ready for that some people do just need that person to be like right this is what you're doing today and that's as much as yeah. they need but then it's the stuff that you're doing around that that they might not realise for years down the line. They might look mm. back and be like, okay, that's what they taught me from that experience. Mm. Yeah, I, um, <coughs> I, I think, think it's a, a process, process of, of of change and in, in coaching. Like, um, initially, uh, you might have to have to sort of like, I've told them of how to um, a squat and and train, and then it, and then it sort of like um it, it, it pro, progresses, and they sort of like, know how to, a squat, and it um it turns turns turns, from sort of like just um, a coach next x x size actually, he coached again, a result, and coaching. It, is someone to, someone to um uh, uh, turn in into a better person? Yeah, definitely. I think there's a big shift I'm seeing in our generation with coaching now is that the kind of people who are coming out of like, the younger years and going, you know what, I want to be a coach, seem to have very much been on some sort of similar journey. They've mm. had some sort of struggle when they were younger, they dealt with their own problems, so it's like an eating disorder, mental health trauma, something. Something's affected mm. them. They've been hurt. Something's changed them. And then they're then deciding after they've gone on this journey or as part of it, because it is part of it, that they are <laughs> that they are going to become a coach to help mm. others because of their own experience. And I, I can say that I've seen it in some older coaches, but nowhere near as much. There's a lot more people now deciding to go and help others because mm. of what they've been through and our generation of noticing it. At least that's my kind of unique perspective. Well, not unique, but that's a kind of what I've noticed more recently and it's I think it's a really good positive change. Yeah, yeah. 100%. On a quick side note there, Taylor, do you want to go let Jack in? I, I do. I he's do. A, he's, he's our next door. guest. Um, I'll be back in two. Yeah, and Taylor's arranged these very close together, so... All right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, thinking about everything we've spoken about today, yeah. then, 
and your whole journey, like try and reflect on everything, what would you say is like one key lesson someone that's listening could take away from this podcast if they just ignored everything else that we've spoken about? What's the one most important thing? Improving in confidence is the um, most important thing you can uh, work on in your life. And whatever is your um, a driver to Im- improve it, it should be a jumped upon and used as simple as that. Yeah. And like you said earlier, just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy. <laughs> no. <laughs> that is something we can all attest yeah. to. Um, but wow, I've had an amazing time on this podcast. Enjoyed this. It has been really good. So thank you so much for your time. No worries. Um, and hopefully we'll get a training session in together soon. I think that is wicked. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming on, buddy. Really, really no, happy to have you on. And thank you for everything you're doing out in the world as well. Uh, cheers, mate. Yeah. I think you, that. What, what I see online is you're, for me anyway, kind of like a good, strong voice in the community that I didn't see a strong voice for online before. And I think it's only going to get stronger with time. Oh, thank you, mate. Thank you. Talking about online, Taylor, do you want to shout out um, Joe's Instagram and places to find him? That's your usual role, isn't it? Yeah, so best place to find you then. That's going to be on Instagram, isn't it? Yep, at correct. Joe underscore Dylan. And no, but at the... Um, a stammer. A PT. That's it, that's the you one. You have one job, Taylor. Mind. One job. <laughs> There's so many Instagram accounts. Everyone's got more than one as well. I do actually have um, a two. Yeah, two. So. The last best place to find you is yeah. at Stammer PT, Stand PT, which is the perfect title for you. Perfect. You own it. Yeah, yeah, and he's got his online training, the CWJ programme, yeah, which correct. is Coaching with Joe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. With Joe. And just because that is for everyone, that's not just people stand as that is. Yeah, everyone... everyone Everyone who has um has got um a low a confidence, yeah. I think everyone can do it yeah. from you anyway. Oh jeez. <laughs> <Stop it. laughs> right. Thank you for that and hopefully see you soon. Yep. Happy bud. Cheers now. Cheers out. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Adventure Athletes Podcast. If you want to follow us online, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at The Adventure Athletes. You can also find us on YouTube at The Adventure Athletes as well. If you click on the link in our bio on either account, you can go straight to our link tree where you can follow us on Spotify, where you can listen to The Adventure Athlete Podcast for free, where we have loads of amazing guests on for across the fitness and adventure industry and the much wider world as well. You can also follow the link in that link tree as well to our free adventure uh, athlete program which is called average to athlete 1.01 currently but we'll be always updating throughout the future as we go so if you do want to try a free program we've got a bodyweight version and a gym based version go follow us there and find out